Now let's get started right away with some definitions. Uh, if we have sat in a research methods course or an introductory statistics course, we might remember seeing a table that looks something like this one, introducing us to the concept of type 1 and type 2 errors. Now, if we can assume that our hypothesized association has a particular value that exists in the population, a particular effect size, then statistical power is simply the probability that we make a correct rejection of the null hypothesis, of course, assuming that the null hypothesis is false. And it can certainly be ideal to plan our sample size ahead of time so that we are able to have highly powered tests for our focal hypotheses of interest. Of course, as I mentioned, an alternative to sample size planning for power is to consider accurate magnitude estimation. And formally, accuracy is defined as the root mean square error for estimating our particular parameter of interest. Uh, on a technical level, an accurate estimate is one that is both unbiased and appropriately precise. Uh, but really the main message to take away is that an accurate estimate implies that the confidence interval for the parameter is uh, sufficiently narrow, meaning that there is a small range of plausible values for that association. Now, very importantly, uh, sample size planning for power and accuracy both have their place in the social and behavioral sciences. Our science has certainly emerged to a point where we can consider multiple investigator goals and multiple different perspectives. And the sample size planning approaches that we choose should be uh, relevant to our particular goals in that context. Now, if our focal goal is to determine whether an effect exists and what the direction or sign of that effect is, then sample size planning for power is likely more appropriate there. And to give us an example of comparing sample size planning for power and accuracy, let's just briefly consider uh, a recent article published in Journal of Applied Psychology that looked at uh, job interviews during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, if these researchers were most interested in determining whether the relationship between job interview anxiety and interview performance uh, exists, and was positive, then sample size planning for power would go along really well with that goal. But if the researchers were instead more interested in determining the precise size of the association between anxiety and performance, then sample size planning for accuracy may make more sense there. We can certainly find statistically uh, significant regression coefficients that still unfortunately have what are called embarrassingly large confidence intervals. And importantly, we can often have goals that consider both uh, power and accuracy, and we can do our sample size planning and consider both of these goals even within the context of a single study. Now, over the past several decades, a variety of articles that contain surveys of statistical power in various subfields have come out. And often the authors of these surveys are sort of lamenting the preponderance of underpowered studies. And I think it's important to know that these surveys certainly have limitations. They often assume a very uh, specific effect size for a variety of different uh, tests within a particular field, and estimates of average power can be uh, highly misleading. But I think we've reached the point that it's clear that since Jacob Cohen's 1960s foray into statistical power, focusing on clinical and social psychology, that at least some areas of the social sciences have not seen too much improvement in terms of the sample sizes that are commonly used. Now, an article published about 10 years ago in Journal of Applied Psychology found uh, reasonable power for a lot of articles published in, uh, in the management field. Uh, but before you all sign off of this presentation and decide uh, this isn't needed, I think it's important to know that the author still noted several areas for improvement. Uh, and especially depending on what area we're working with, um, we might be using sample sizes that are too small to reach our goals.
And in particular, small true effect sizes are very common in the social sciences. We're often estimating uh, particular associations that are nuanced and perhaps small in absolute size, but still highly important. And our sample sizes are often inadequate for those small effects. Uh, in addition, sample size planning has received a lot more attention in the experimental areas that use analysis of variance and a little bit less so uh, for linear regression models. Now let's start out by focusing on a more selfish perspective, why we as researchers should uh, care about statistical power. Uh, of course, when we increase our sample size and we increase our statistical power, we are also increasing the likelihood that we are able to detect an association that would be highly surprising if the null hypothesis were true. This is the definition of a statistically significant p-value. And as researchers, we believe that our interventions matter and our hypotheses uh, are certainly important. And uh, we don't want to miss associations that may have real implications for policy and practice. And as much as we uh, may dislike it, uh, publication bias does remain a fact of life in the current publishing environment. Uh, publication bias is partly due to journals continuing to favor uh, statistically significant results, uh, particularly st statistically significant focal results. On the other hand, researchers themselves are less likely to submit articles for publication that contain uh, only non-significant results. And so for whatever reason that publication bias continues, it remains true that uh, as we uh, increase our statistical power, uh, we have a higher likelihood of disseminating our research and publishing. But despite the fact that our sample sizes are often smaller uh, than uh, needed for our particular hypotheses of interest, researchers have pointed out that articles are still being published at a higher rate than would be expected given lower levels of statistical power. And I like to refer to this as the power publication paradox. Now in regression in particular, Maxwell has pointed out that regression studies are often uh, extremely underpowered to detect a particular association of interest. For example, we might have five predictors in our regression model and uh, four of them are covariates and we are particularly interested in one of those predictors. Uh, regression studies are often highly underpowered for that particular uh, test. On the other hand, the power levels are often much more adequate if we were simply inclined to uh, uh, find the effect of any of the predictors. For example, if we didn't care which predictors showed up as significant, our studies may indeed be adequately powered. Uh, so this means we may be publishing and interpreting results based on predictors that did show up as significant, while unfortunately missing true relationships that may have important implications. And of course, questionable research practices like secretly hypothesizing after results are known or unadjusted multiple testing can certainly make it easier to publish despite uh, these effects not existing in reality. Uh, now, how would that have anything to do with statistical power? Well, I believe that as our fields continue to reduce QRPs and emphasize transparent research, that a priori sample size planning will become even more important to be able to publish and disseminate our work. Now, let's take a much bigger picture perspective and think about how sample size planning and power affects uh, our field at large. So let's take a little example here. Let's assume that over the next few weeks, months, or decades, however long it takes you, you read exactly 100 journal articles. And let's suppose that each of these articles just reports one statistical test and the p-value is statistically significant. Now, at first glance, we might want to believe that all 100 studies report a correct result because in each and every case, the authors obtain data that would be very unlikely if the null hypothesis were true. But should you believe that the null has been correctly rejected in every one of these studies? Now, uh, if I was thinking about this, I might think 
uh, would be the proportion or percentage of studies that report an incorrect result. The type one error rate is the probability that we reject the null hypothesis given it's true, and we typically set that at about uh, 5%. But this prompt is actually encouraging us to think about the reverse conditional probability to the type 1 error rate. In other words, the probability that the null hypothesis is true, given we have rejected the null hypothesis. And this is not the same thing as the type 1 error rate. Uh, this is a quantity known as the false discovery rate. And importantly, how close the false discovery rate is to the type 1 error rate depends explicitly on statistical power. Now, in practice, it can be difficult to calculate a false discovery rate for a particular real field with empirical studies. There are a lot of assumptions that we need to make, uh, but as a pedagogical tool, what this tells us is that if our field cares about statistical power and uses the sample sizes that can achieve higher levels of power, uh, this will lower the number of false discoveries in our field and improve the chances at replication. 